Hey everybody, Ruminate here. Hope this video finds you well. Today we're going to be pondering politics. It's January 2022 and that means we are one year into President Biden's first and perhaps only term as the 46th commander in chief. Now, rather than do a, a, like a four hour video, I wanted to do multiple videos on various aspects of policy. So coronavirus, the economy, foreign policy, uh, human, civil, and voting rights, yada, yada. This video is a foreign policy video, but it's about a specific foreign policy event that I thought merited its own coverage. And that is the extraction from Afghanistan, which concluded by like August 31st, I think it was, 2021. Now, there are two reasons I decided to do this. Number one, it's the single biggest foreign policy event of the president's first year. Uh, and number two, it's a political turning point uh, for the Biden administration because previously President Biden's approval ratings were quite high and then about the time of the extraction, they began to fall and they have struggled in a downward trajectory ever since. Uh, the other thing I want to say is like every Ruminate video, this is unscripted, but because of the, uh, the facts and figures and numbers that are associated with this video, I will occasionally be glancing at notes. So there will be some eye contact breakage and I hope you don't hold it against me. I am still into you. Okay, so let's jump into it. Um, the war in Afghanistan was the single longest military engagement in the history of the United States. And we've been around for 250 years, and we've been in many military engagements, so that's saying something. In terms of financial cost, the United States invested more than $2.2 trillion into this conflict uh, across the span of 20 years in terms of assets and, and the initial invasion costs and occupation and investing in the Afghan national government. Um, and more importantly, um, between 2,500, excuse me, 2,400 and 2,500 American lives were lost, okay? So it was very expensive. And the consensus of poll after poll after poll after poll for years has been that the vast majority of Americans wanted us to get the hell out of Afghanistan. Uh, they thought our strategic objectives were long accomplished, and it was just now a waste of manpower and resources that we could apply elsewhere. But no president wanted to pull the trigger on this because I think most of them realized it was always going to be messy and complicated. So Obama didn't do it, Trump didn't do it, and it fell to Biden. Uh, president Biden made the commitment that he was going to do it, and he is the only one who followed through on it. But the commitment to leave Afghanistan was not negotiated by President Biden. It was, in fact, negotiated by President Trump more than a year earlier in February 2020 in an agreement called the Doha Agreement, where the Trump, administ Trump administration negotiated a withdrawal from Afghanistan directly with the Taliban, the group that wanted to reclaim uh, Afghanistan from the Afghan national government. Okay. So the Trump administration dealt directly with the Taliban, committed to withdrawing U.S. forces in their totality, as long as the Taliban agreed to reach uh, or to meet certain terms, including the most important one being they don't attack any U.S. ally or U.S. resident or U.S. native or U.S. troop. There were other terms as well, but th that was the broad thesis. Now, the Trump administration surprisingly jumped on this like, like white on rice. I mean, they instantly began to retrograde and downgrade U.S. troop presence from 13,000 down to 2,500. President Trump also arranged for the release of 1,500 imprisoned Taliban fighters who went back into the waiting arms of the Taliban themselves. Now, in the meantime, the Taliban wasn't allowing attacks on U.S. troops or allies, but they weren't meeting any of their other terms as negotiated by the Trump administration. And yet President Trump continued to retrograde forces entirely. So in November 2020, President Trump loses re-election and Joe Biden becomes the president-elect, is inaugurated January 2021, and he inherits all this. He inherits an agreement made with the Taliban from the previous administration or by the previous administration, and he also inherits a significantly diminished military presence in Afghanistan, 2,500 troops, which is nowhere near enough to occupy a country and police a country the size of Afghanistan. So President Biden halts the deal and says, look, we need to review this. The previous guy made this deal. I'm not breaking it per se, but I just need, I just need a minute to review it. So he orders a, a full government review of this agreement from the Justice Department, State Department, and Department of Defense. And then in April 2021, he says, look, there was originally a May 2020 de deadline. I can't meet that. I will, however, agree to start in May and end it 
by September 11, 2021. The U.S. will be fully out of Afghanistan by September 2021. The Taliban seem to agree to this, and thus the retrograde under Biden continues. However, eventually the Taliban decides to invade Afghanistan in force since they don't feel like they have to worry about the United States. They're not, they're not risking a fight with a global superpower, and now it's just them and the government that they want to replace, which is the Afghan national government. Now, by all accounts, this is a completely, this should be a lopsided contest on paper because the ANA, the Afghan National Army, has like 300,000 troops to deploy, whereas the Taliban is only deploying 75,000. So it's more than a three to one advantage. And yet in 11 days, 11 days, the Taliban has essentially conquered the country, including the capital, Kabul. And that is due to incompetence and corruption on the ANA, the weakness of its upper military and political leaders, and a lot of cunning from the Taliban and, and you know, uh, shaking hands and squeaking wheels with the outer regions of Afghanistan who were welcoming the Taliban back. So in 11 days, which exceeded any estimation, even the most cynical uh, diplomatic or military assessment uh, of the situation. So now the United States is attempting to complete a withdrawal from a country that is occupied by a t certainly a terroristic group, if not an outright terror group, with whom they have a very tenuous uh, ceasefire. Okay, so now there's a deadline, and they are in a hostile, overthrown country, and the United States has to complete the withdrawal. But at the time, the Taliban had just as much incentive for the United States to get the hell out, so there were no attacks that we are aware of by the Taliban or allowed by the Taliban against the United States. They wanted the country back. They didn't want to have to tangle with the U.S., so we had a very tentative mutual understanding based on mutual interests. Now, unfortunately, there's a third faction involved here, and that is the terrorist group ISIS-K that is opposed both to the Taliban and the United States. So during the withdrawal from Afghanistan, ISIS-K uh, sneaks a suicide bomber into Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, and the major population center, detonates a bomb, and kills like 13 U.S. service people. And back here in the United States, people are even more pissed. They were pissed uh, so far because of the collapse of the Afghan government. They blame President Biden. Uh, for not propping them up sufficiently in a, in a botched withdrawal. And then when you add a body count of U.S. service people attached to it, uh, then the the public opinion started to go really sour for President Biden, furthered along by uh, the Republican Party. Uh, but at the end of it, by the, uh, August 31st, uh, the United States Armed Forces had airlifted more than 120,000 people out of a collapsing, hostile country. It was an unprecedented military accomplishment with respect to logistics, okay? But now it caused a political crisis at home because even though the public wanted out of Afghanistan, they wanted essentially a perfect extraction from it where there would be no body count. And because there was a body count, President Biden began to feel the heat at home. Now, to his credit, unlike uh, many of his predecessors undoubtedly would, uh, President Biden took command of responsibility. He says the buck stops here. You know, quoting, uh, I believe it was President Truman, a uh, famous quote from him. He's like, look, I have command responsibility. This happened on my watch, but we're doing the best we can. Um, and unfortunately, there were other complications as well. There were still uh, estimates between hundreds and thousands of either U.S. people, U United States citizens or United States allies still left in Afghanistan when they withdrew. Now, to also be clear, the Biden administration spent months reaching out exhaustively phone calls, emails, press announcements again and again and again and again and again. I can't remember how many communications were made by the State Department to all American citizens and natives and allies. Like, look, we're withdrawing. This is happening. Here are the steps if you want to get out. Now, of course, the problem is that uh, Americans are not required, of course, to register their location with the federal government. So we only have estimates and we have best case information, but it's not like there's a tracking chip that the United States can use to track down every single American or U.S. ally in Afghanistan and snatch them up. Um, they, they had to leave of their own accord, and we didn't have information on literally everybody. But State and Defense Department both operated under the impression that as of August 31st, those who made their commitments to wanting to get out known were taken out. 
of Afghanistan. They were, they were uh, excised, extracted from Afghanistan successfully. And those who were left behind uh, were those very few that the State and Defense Department weren't able to reach. And more importantly, those who were reached but chose to stay, either because they have friends and family in the area, or because they wanted to help. But the, the bottom line is that the United States military nor State Department could compel them to leave. Those who made their desire to leave known uh, got out, according to the State and Defense Department. And that resulted in, again, over 120,000 people airlifted out. So this was an extraction that was uh, seen by many people as botched. The Afghan National Army collapsed. Uh, 13 service people were killed by ISIS-K. The United States had to cooperate with the Taliban during the extraction, essentially work in parallel. The Taliban was essentially providing security for the, uh, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, you know, providing checkpoints, allowing people in. A lot of people were uncomfortable with that level of cooperation between the Taliban and the United States. Um, and uh, the idea that there would still be Americans left behind, uh, willingly or unwillingly, um, was just a bad optics situation for the Biden administration, which the Republican Party took advantage of. Um, in terms of uh, another, another criticism, I'm sorry, I, I neglected to mention was common criticism is that there was um, a major airfield uh, controlled by the United States military called Bagram Air Base, and the United States um, abandoned it uh, in order to operate exclusively out of the airport in Kabul, and we will get to that in a second. Um, so anyway, that is a recap of the, of the extraction from Afghanistan, and the State and Defense Department are still working with the Taliban and other allies to make opportunities available for those who want to leave, those American citizens and U.S. allies who want to leave, uh, negotiating it diplomatically, and we will see what comes of it. Uh, I know in the days after the extraction, there were successful air flights out of Kabul to uh, Qatar, uh, a nearby country, and from Qatar, uh, the, the people on those flights were allowed to disperse. Um, but uh, we will see what comes of it in the ongoing months. Um, how would I grade the Biden withdrawal from Afghanistan? I think that it was largely a success um, for a few reasons. Number one, this was a deal that was not negotiated by the Biden administration. It was negotiated by the Trump administration. That can't be stressed enough. Donald Trump dealt directly with the Taliban and made and cut a deal. Okay, so anyone bitching about the deal uh, should refer their complaints to the Trump administration. But those bitching about the deal are Republicans, and they wouldn't do that when President Trump was negotiating it because they're selective in their criticism. Now, it is true that when President Biden came into office, he could have disregarded the Doha agreement, but he had incentive not to because, again, it was a ceasefire negotiated with the Taliban. If he tore up the Doha agreement, um, according to DOD experts, it would have incentivized, and they strongly believe that the Taliban would have resumed attacks on U.S. troops and allies because the Taliban wanted to take back Afghanistan no matter what. And so if the U.S. wasn't going to withdraw from Afghanistan, then they had nothing to lose and they might as well attack U.S. troops. So he had a human you know, that he had lives depending on him following through with the agreement. The other thing is that because President Trump continued the retrograde of U.S. forces and assets, that meant when Biden came into office, not only did he have this commitment that would be really bad if he broke, he also was operating with a considerably smaller number of U.S. troops, 13,000 at the time the agreement was made under Trump, down to 2,500, thanks to Trump. That's nowhere near enough to hold the uh, you know, a, a country the size of Afghanistan against 75,000 Taliban and a collapsing ANA military, he would have essentially had to reinvade the country, which Republicans would have criticized him for and the public would have hated. So he was truly between a rock and a hard place. He did the responsible thing, asked for a brief halt so his administration could review the deal, and then they managed to get the timeline lengthened. Okay, look, I can't make that May 2021 deadline negotiated by my predecessor, but I can commit to Feb to September 2021, and we will start in earnest in May. Okay, so he was able to, to negotiate an extension. Trump wanted us to get out of there even sooner, so I don't know how that would have helped stabilize the country. If the country fell when we were there longer, why would leaving sooner help the stabilization, right? It would have just accelerated the Taliban's timetable. 
So he inherited a mess, and he had to execute it the most responsible way possible. And I think he did. He listened to his advisors. His advisors were the ones who recommended shutting down Bagram Air Base, which would have required, I think, between 2,500 and 5,000 U.S. troops alone to operate and defend. And it was miles away from Kabul, the major population center. So those are two reasons why his military advisors recommended that he shutter Bagram Air Base and consolidate forces in Kabul to oversee the extraction. The third reason is because even though Bagram Air, Air Base had two airfields, right, and could send two planes at once, whereas Kabul only had one, according to General uh, McKenzie, who was the leader of the United States Central Command, the guy overseeing military operations in Afghanistan, Bagram Air Base only had the resources to load one plane at a time, so they wouldn't have been able to take advantage of that second airfield, whereas Kabul had uh, more, resor more resources and more means to load planes effectively, efficiently, and timely. So for these three reasons, uh, the military advised that they abandon Bagram and consolidate all efforts to get everybody out of Afghanistan through Kabul, the capital and major population center. Um, with respect to the 13 service people that were killed, that, of course, is a colossal tragedy, and President Biden should and did take responsibility for it happening on his watch. You know, any time that he's the president, the president is the commander in chief, and he or she bears command responsibility, which means quite literally, even if they couldn't do anything to alter the outcome, because it happened on their watch, the buck stops there, they have command responsibility. And President Biden did take command responsibility. But it must be noted that this was the result of a suicide bombing from a third faction. It wasn't the Taliban who arranged for this. It was ISIS-K taking advantage of the situation. Um, moreover, I just want to say that, yes, while it was a tragedy that 13 service people were killed during the extraction, uh, people have been killed in Afghanistan. U.S. service people have been killed in Afghanistan for years, including under President Trump. And more people died in Afghanistan, more service people died in Afghanistan under President Trump than they did under President Biden. So not to say that you can't criticize both, but most people criticizing President Biden are not and did not criticize both. They're willing to sweep the casualties that happened under the Trump administration under the rug uh, to focus exclusively on the casualties that occurred under the Biden administration. And that's just a double standard that's unacceptable. So there's that. Um, in terms of the uh, ANA collapsing, again, that was happened on an accelerated timetable that uh, no serious uh, diplomat or military expert anticipated. Now, many of them did anticipate as the extraction continued that the Taliban would overwhelm the ANA, despite the various advantages that the ANA enjoyed. But according to, again, General Mark Milley, General McKenzie, and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, nobody anticipated the Taliban, the 75,000-strong Taliban, sweeping a 300,000-strong defended Taliban in 11 days. Okay, Now, it still happened, but we can only do things based on the intelligence and information that we had. So we just didn't have the means to realistically anticipate it because it does sound quite ridiculous to think about. Another thing that the Biden administration is criticized for is our, our assets left behind, and this was constantly peddled by right-wingers. You know, they have – now the Taliban has billions of dollars worth of U.S. material in Afghanistan, and that is highly inaccurate. Um, according to Department of Defense reports, all major pieces of, of equipment, anything that posed a strategic threat to the United States – uh, was destroyed or rendered inoperable by the United States during their withdrawal. Okay, so certainly uh, the the Afghan army inherited you know a ton of handguns and machine guns and and small arms you know that don't pose a threat to the continental United States. Um, but most of that was equipment that was left behind with the the Afghan army. So during our twenty year long war invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. The Afghan National Army was armed by American weapons, but that wasn't Biden's fault. That happened under Trump. That happened under Obama in two terms and un under George W. Bush as well under two terms. So over the span of 20 years, the Afghan National Army was loaned, given, or sold U.S. military assets like helicopters and uh, firearms and missile launchers and things like that. There was absolutely no way possible 
no way that any president on that timetable, any, would be able to go through Afghanistan and collect every American gun, every American machine gun, every American missile launcher, and every, I mean, it's just not possible. No way is that possible. And again, it wasn't U.S. equipment at that point. It was U.S. made or U.S. sold equipment that was the property of the Afghan National Army and scattered with the Afghan National Army across Afghanistan. It wasn't like it was in one place that the U.S. just forgot to, you know, empty on our way out the door. So it's just a disingenuous claim. So as for my money, I think the Biden administration did the best they could with an impossible situation. And President Biden showed tremendous integrity and tremendous commitment to being willing to assume the political risks of the extraction where President Trump didn't, President Obama didn't, and President Bush didn't, okay? Uh, he took a very flawed, uh, perhaps ill-advised agreement and executed it to the best of his ability. 120 plus thousand people were airlifted out of a rapidly collapsing hostile nation. 13 service people were tragically lost in combat. But President Biden took responsibility for it, and um, more, more service people have been killed under President Trump and President Obama and President Bush in Afghanistan separately than under President Biden as well. So even by that metric, he is performing better than his predecessors, Republican or Democrat. So as far as why de Republicans are making a big hay out of this, because they're using every opportunity they can to tar and feather the president, make it harder for, his, uh, for him to do his job. Um, and certainly, this was not a smooth transition, certainly, or smooth extraction. Uh, it never was going to be. So there are pl there's plenty of turbulence. There are plenty of, of um, complications that you can weaponize for political purposes. Uh, I just don't think it's particularly good faith to do so. So I think overall, the extraction of Afghanistan was a success. Um, it's what the American people wanted. Uh, what that will mean for the future, um, there, there's, there's reason. There is reason to wonder, right? Because now we have to monitor Afghanistan from afar, from what they call over-the-horizon capability, as opposed to the intelligence that would be gathered uh, more reliably by having people uh, in the country and boots on the ground. Um, so it's possible that Afghanistan will eventually mutate into another threat to the United States. It is possible, but that possibility would have always been there even under President Trump or President Obama or President uh, George W. Bush. So grade him however you want, but especially when you take into consideration what the predecessors did and likely would have done based on the things they did do, uh, President Biden, I think, is the best of them with respect to how he handled Afghanistan, as hot of a take as that might be. So anyway, that is my thoughts in terms of that particular foreign policy event, the Biden administration's handling of the extraction from Afghanistan. Um, if you agree or disagree, leave a comment. Let's have a conversation. And uh, this is Ruminate Out. We will be covering other aspects of the Biden administration and pondering politics very soon. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Now, we're looking to grow the channel as aggressively as possible this year. So if you haven't yet, we'd really appreciate it if you like, subscribe, and follow us on any or all of our social media pages. The links are below. And whether you agree or disagree with the contents of this particular video, you are welcome to leave a comment because we are always open to constructive feedback and discourse. And on that note, I look forward to pondering politics and pop culture again with you real soon.